loving God, we thank you that as we meet together in this way, we resume old friendships. We thank you for one another and the many ways in which we've shared together over the years, uh, the blessings that we have known together and been to each other. Uh, we thank you for Nigel, the way that he has served our Baptist family and beyond, for things he has written and the many things that he has said. Thank you for his heart for you and his desire to help us to plumb the depths in our understanding of, of you and your ways. And we ask that you would be guiding him and all of us as we uh, consider these issues of ministry and retirement and psychology and how it relates to us and how it relates to our ministry and to those with whom we serve and those we seek to encourage. So grant us your blessing in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So, Nigel, uh, we're very yes. grateful to you for joining us, giving your time. Um, it's uh, nice that you've uh, you're able to join us easily. It's a shame on such a lovely day you have missed a wonderful drive through the countryside <laughs> of the north. But uh, we welcome you, and I hand over to you now. Okay, thank you, John, and hello to everybody. It's um, good to be together, even in this virtual form. And I'm happy to talk about retirement, uh, provided people understand that I don't really regard myself as an expert on the topic, other than the fact that I'm living through it and discovering things along the way. But the odd thing is that um, when John phoned me to ask if I could do something like this, um, he had been beaten to it by Mike Behensky, now in the East Midlands area, uh, to ask if I would do the same kind of thing for uh, a group down there, quite a big group. And the odd thing was that it was on exactly the same day that uh, it was projected, i.e. last Thursday. Um, so I, I couldn't do both at the same time. That's something I've not perfected yet in terms of gifts of the spirit by location. Um, but uh, uh, we were able to fix on today. And um, what struck me uh, uh, straight away last week uh, in looking at the screen and the faces of the people uh, that, that were there uh, was simply how much I missed seeing people. This, if, if there's something about retirement that I would say is fairly near the top, it's uh, simply that I don't see people I would really like to see. And uh, this has been uh, made worse, of course, by COVID, uh, by the fact that we're not supposed to see anybody or hardly anybody. So um, looking at your faces, people I have walked with along the way over the years and enjoyed being with makes me um, very glad to be able to have this kind of interaction. And I hope that you uh, get a sense of my own pleasure in, uh, in being with you, uh, even if it's uh, in this way. So the fact that we're all here together means either that we're retired or that we're thinking of retired, rather like John, or we're planning to retire. And we need uh, either to reflect upon our experience or to begin to prepare emotionally uh, for it. And I think it's worth saying straight away that we are enormously privileged in our society to have a period of retirement at the end of our lives or in the last uh, stage of our lives. Um, and not only so, we are actually supported by the state, um, by uh, old age pensions, um, in order to, to have this uh, period of time. And I don't take that for granted. I'm very, very glad that I live in that kind of society um, where there is that degree of solidarity and mutual support um, for all the citizens. However, sadly, there are some people who try to spoil retirement for us by making statements such as there is no such thing as retirement in the Bible. I'm sure you've heard that said. You've probably said it in uh, some moment of anguish along the way. And of course, it's technically true. There is nothing at all about retirement as such as we know it. Certainly nothing about old age pensions in the Bible. Um, but I suggest that there is uh, a better vision, a finer vision, and that's the one that's recorded in Micah chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, 
and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. And that, I think, is an ideal picture of uh, stability, security, fulfillment, uh, enjoyment um, at the end of a person's life. And as such, I think it is something to be devoutly hoped for. Not just for ourselves, of course, but for all people. We would wish that everybody might enjoy um, such a retirement. So if in the final phase of our lives we can enjoy such contentment, security and peace, um, then I think we count ourselves blessed. And I had an example of that just a few weeks ago when I was speaking with a brother-in-law, now aged 84, um, and suffering from an asbestos-related lung disease, which he contracted as a youngster in the Navy. Uh, and this will in time surely end his life. But um, I've never seen him so content, so delighting in his eight grandchildren, um, delighting in a loving and attentive wife, a successful and useful career as a police inspector, uh, in the fact that he owned his own house and was financially secure and also able to pass an inheritance on to his children and his grandchildren. And I thought to myself, that's not a bad place to be uh, when you come to the end. So it's worth remembering, however, that uh, retirement is not the end of life, <laughs> but the beginning of a new phase of life. And as I've tried to indicate, a privileged phase of life and that has become increasingly privileged as our levels of health care and prosperity have grown um, over the years. Even looking back to my early days, I recognize a huge leap forward in all kinds of ways that enhance life. And this phase um, ought to be as productive as any other phase in our lives, perhaps more so. And perhaps we should intend that it be more productive than any other uh, phase of life. And um, if we look back to the early 20th century when um, old age pensions were introduced, I think it's by the Labour, the Liberal government at the time, uh, this was envisaged as a short period, perhaps five years, at the end of a hard, grueling life down the mines or in the factories or in the fields. And it wasn't expected that it would last all that long. But now, what we're looking forward to is the third age, um, possibly even as much as a quarter of our whole lifespan. And a lot of us probably have talked over the years about, oh, we'll do that when we retire. And we've sort of postponed people to this, um, this, uh, this time. I was going to say illusory, but I hope it won't be illusory. This time in the future when we will do all the things that we have wanted to do over the years, things we've dreamt of doing. And probably uh, you, um, like me, uh, have or have had your bucket list, so-called. Uh, the things that you uh, definitely want to do before you die. And I have to say uh, that I have got through the first draft of my bucket list. And I'm now I'm making up uh, another list. And you might in parallel have another list. Um, and you could call it, uh, a stuff it list, the things that you are definitely not going to be bothered doing or engaging in uh, in this period, the tiresome things that you had to do because you had to do them, which you no longer have to do. And, um, and there's time uh, for most of us, there's time. Now, I know that people die early. Of course, they die early. I might die uh, tomorrow. Who knows? Um, but UK life expectancy for men at the former retiring age of 65 is about 18 years, and for women, uh, it's about 21 years. So in this third age, uh, this third, this fourth quarter, as I've referred to it, uh, there is time for many of us, for most of us. So now at the age of 72, I checked this the other day on the UK life expectancy website, I might expect, uh, actuarially speaking, uh, to live to the age of 85. 
And that would be consistent with uh, my ancestors who tended to live uh, into their 80s and 90s. And I have a one in four chance, apparently, of living to the age of 92. As I've, um, as I've thought about this over the years, I've, I've thought to myself, oh, I'll be glad to get to such and such an age, and uh, I'll be content with that. I suspect that as I get older, I'm less content with the age I first thought of, and I want to push that age further into the future and uh, make it uh, last longer. But uh, on the other hand, I don't want to live so long that I engage in a, a catastrophic health failure and uh, don't have any quality of life. I'd sooner die before that came my way. So I'm dividing my thoughts in these two sessions into theological reflections and then into psychological. And the, the, the theological reflections revolve around the issue of um, do we cease to be ministers when we are no longer in office? Uh, when we retire and we stand down from a pastoral office, pastor of a local church, regional minister, tutor in a theological college, whatever, uh, do we then cease to be ministers? Or do we continue to be ministers with a sense of uh, obligation? And uh, this goes back to a debate which has happened uh, in Baptist circles in the second half of the 20th century. There was a debate between Arthur Dakin president of Bristol Baptist College and Ernest Payne about um, whether you cease to be a minister when you hold pastoral office and Dakin um, took the view uh, which is quite widespread in the in the international Baptist world I think uh, that when you are no longer pastoring a church then you're no longer a minister and of course he was putting that view forward as principal of a college so he presumably regarded himself as no longer a minister um, and uh, Payne uh, took a different kind of view. He argued uh, explicitly against Dakin that when you are a minister, you are a minister of the whole church, not just of a local church. And therefore, when you retire, you continue to be a minister within the recognition, uh, within the communion of the wider church uh, throughout uh, the world. You do not surrender your identity when you are no longer in a local church office. So adjacent to that, there's another debate that's more recent, and it's the constant debate, uh, it seems to be, about whether ministry is a function or whether, whether it's an, onto an ontology, whether it is something you do that you're set aside to do, a task, a role, or whether it's a way of being, this is the kind of language this is used, whether you're called to exist ontologically in a certain way as a, as a witness uh, to um, the God who has called you. Um, and you can find in our union both points of view represented. Um, the idea of uh, uh, the functional view is that ministry is being asked to do a certain job, a job that needs to be done, uh, whereas um, the ontological view is that you are ordained to a way of life, and this, in the, in the thoughts of some, is, and uh, using Catholic language, is indelible. You never lose it once, it's, uh, once, once you've got it, once you've... Um, uh, been called and set aside uh, in this way. So from that point of view, uh, you are a minister to the end of your life. Now, I do confess that this is one of the debates I find it hard to get into, um, despite the fact that good friends of mine have argued uh, largely for the ontological view, but I, I, <laughs> I regard them as being a bit up themselves, to tell you the truth. Um, and the danger is that it becomes about me, about my status, about uh, whatever. Um, uh, and I can't conceive of what it is to be without doing. I mean, how can I be anything in abstract? Um, and I can't conceive of doing without undergirding that doing with a certain way of living. So to me, these two things are inseparable. They are they. They are not easily distinguished, and uh, I find it hard to get my mind around them. 
Um, so uh, the way I prefer to think, and I think it's a more Baptist way of thinking, uh, the better lens is that of calling. Uh, what is my calling? I, am I still called? So when we candidate for ministry, when we began to feel that sense of inner constraint, and when we began to talk to uh, well, an area superintendent, in my case, or uh, to a college about going in for training, um, this is the big question. Are you being called? If you're, if you're not called, then don't bother. Uh, if you don't have a strong sense of call, then don't even think about it. Um, and so calling proved to be the decisive thing, a calling which was personal, um, which was then confirmed by a local church, by an association ministerial recognition committee, by uh, the acceptance in a college, then three, four, five years of training, and then an, an AM period, a newly accredited period. Um, all of this is to test out the calling and to test out the suitability. And it seems to me that that concept of a vocation, a calling, is the easier one with which to deal. After all, if you take the ontological view and somebody comes along and says, I was ordained, but I no longer believe I am a minister, um, that, that could be seen as a failure um, to actually be faithful to, to God. Um, and I would be very careful about wanting to say that. I want to respect people's own sense of what it is. And I do have friends who believe that they were called to minister to one particular church. And when they were no longer ministering to that church, they, they, they thought the call had been fulfilled. Um, so I want to argue that the question is, what do I believe before God? Um, is my continuing calling, is it still there? Has it changed? And uh, also, importantly, is it recognized? Do other people still recognize it by looking to me for the kinds of ministry that ministers um, offer. And that I think uh, puts us in a, a good situation because it means that we may have to say to God, are you renewing your call in this new phase of my life? And how is it that you would have me live out that call? Now for me, being subjective, since I retired, uh, the sense of call is still there. And um, I feel, still feel myself to be defined by it. This defines my life. It's, um, it's what I overridingly am about. Uh, it may have modified uh, in the sense that I no longer feel the same sense of ob obligation to respond to requests. So when people ask me to do things, I recognize that I do have the freedom to say no. Although, to tell you the truth, most of the time I still say yes, uh, which is uh, exactly what I've done for most of my life. And I also recognize that uh, this could just be a habit, you know, after having lived this way for 40, almost 50 years. Is it just a habit I can't get out of thinking of myself in these terms? And uh, sincerely before God, I believe that there is still a call of God on my life, although it may be a little bit more mooted. Um, and where it's mooted is in believing that I do not need before God to run a church or to run a college. This is the thing I'm very glad <laughs> to be free of. I don't need to carry that primary responsibility for uh, an institution or, in the case of a church, um, a community. I can contribute and I'm happy to do so, but I don't believe that I need before God to take the lead in the way that uh, I will describe shortly as being relatively burdensome, uh, probably for many of us. Uh, in fact, thinking about this since last week, I, it struck me that um, the state I'm now, well, I am a grandparent, but I'm also a retired ministry. It seems to me to be also a bit like a grandparent. They've been there, they've done it, they've carried the responsibility, they've brought up children, they've had the responsibility of childcare, but now they no longer have that responsibility uh, as a primary focus. Now it's passed on to the next generation as it's bound to do, but a grandparent can still be there in the background, called upon when needed, providing a sense of 
security, of love, of compassion, of support, of encouragement, doing all those things. Um, and, uh, and these are very beneficial roles, as the role of a grandparent uh, is, I think, also a very beneficial role. And the corollary of that um, is that the communion of churches to which I belong, uh, in this case, the Northwest Baptist Association and the Baptist Union of Great Britain, which I have served and which has served me and served me well, I would have to say, uh, does well to take account of its retired ministers, does well to support them and uh, to know where they are, who they are what they're capable of, what they're not capable of, what they want to do, what they don't want to do. And uh, that kind of uh, bondedness uh, can mean that um, the things that we still have to offer can be identified and can be put forward and applied. So the retired have every potential of being a wholesome resource. And it accords um, well with uh, them when they are valued and not allowed to feel that they've just fallen off the edge and they've been forgotten about now. And that happens very quickly, I have to say. Um, I noticed that at college, uh, you know, I'm the emeritus principal of Spurgeon's College, <laughs> but uh, I was there not long ago and I went into the finance officer's off, uh, room just to say hello because I like him. And he wasn't there, but there was an assistant there who'd been appointed since I was principal. And uh, I asked if uh, Harin was around. He wasn't around. And uh, so uh, the very nice young lady said, um, are you a former student? <laughs> <laughs> to which the answer, of course, was yes, I was a former student. But, uh, but you do get forgotten about relatively quickly uh, in uh, the ongoing march of life. So this question of being a, a resource, um, you don't want to run things. Actually, I'm paranoid about this. Um, if people ask me to run anything, I immediately step back three paces and say, uh, no, I'm happy to help, happy to contribute, but I don't want to run even the lowliest thing, such as a house group, if a house group is a lowly thing. Um, but there are many delights that uh, we're able to um, share. Uh, um, we can identify with Paul in his talking about his anxiety for all the churches. Um, but um, uh, we no longer have to feel that same degree of anxiety. You know, I am worried that this may, I may be the one on whose watch everything goes pear shaped and it all falls apart. And that's the legacy that I leave. That anxiety became a bit of a, an acute one for me towards the end of my period as a principal. Um, partly because of things happening in the world of higher education and all sorts of governmental regulations that were changing that were causing me to go hairless. I mean, really, I, was, I used to be six foot six, but now I'm only five foot ten because of uh, all of that. Um, and I don't want that anxiety. And it seems to me I am a better minister when I am not anxious. There is this thing called non-anxious presence that uh, if, you, if you're really worried about the, the people and about yourself in relation to them, when you're dealing with them, it kind of takes away from the disinterested, genuine care that you're able to offer them. And a non-anxious presence seems to me to be something that is more feasible in retirement than uh, earlier on. I, I, I used to think about this in relation to a Catholic priest who was a friend of mine, Peter Dolan in Preston, and um, bless him, Peter was required as a Catholic priest to work to the age of 75. Actually, he chose to work into his 80s because he was afraid that if he left his parish church, the bishop would close the church down. Um, eventually, he died of uh, prostate cancer and he was working to the end of his life. And it often struck me with Peter and those like him that um, if they didn't have to carry that burden, they would still have very valuable ministries to offer without the anxiety uh, that, uh, that goes with it. So here is a new phase of constructive ministry in which we can draw upon the knowledge and the experience and the wisdom and the relationships of past years. We're doing that now, drawing upon relationships that have been forged over many years and in different 
circumstances and it's great to be able to do that there's the freedom of not having to prove anything because most of us have that sense of imposter syndrome um where we we're not really sure that we're up to this god may have called us but we also have a sense of our incompetence as well as our competence and um uh and yet uh, there are opportunities where we can give freely uh, without having to prove anything. It doesn't matter if people don't like us. Um, we can do things like moderating local churches. This is a huge ministry, helping churches in that awkward phase between one ministry and another. Uh, that can sometimes become interim ministry, giving more, actually, where you do take back responsibility, at least for a period of time. And, and that's, the, that's the release. It's for a period of time, not for the indefinite future. And many people do feel that they still have abundant energy to give, um, and therefore it ought to be employed. There's the joy of itinerant preaching. I've always enjoyed itinerant preaching myself. I've done a lot of it, and I've enjoyed it a huge amount. Uh, meeting new people, seeing new situations. I'd usually go and go early and look around an area just to get the feel of it. Um, uh, those wonderful lunches you get fed uh, at dinner time by your kind hosts. So, you know, all these are great things. And you get paid sometimes to do it too. So that's a, an added joy. Sometimes they even give you flowers to take home to your other half. Um, and that too is appreciated, not least by the other half, especially when you say, I've brought these for you. <laughs> so the joy of itinerant preaching. And in the old Baptist times um, of my uh, younger years, they, there was often a, a caption in the, the news for you section um, about such and such minister who had retired. And uh, here's a quote, was available to serve the churches and uh, was signalling their desire to continue preaching. The supervising, there's more of that happens now than used to happen. Supervising for a college, for instance, I used to seize upon early retired ministers and then uh, get them to, uh, to help the college by supervising students in their placements. And uh, by and large, they liked doing it and Often they would say, well, I, I'm not really very good at this, but of course they knew more than they knew they knew. And they were able to uh, offer the wisdom of their experience to um, students along the way. Uh, with that, there's mentoring in the NAM period. Uh, those who have the inclination can write, they can lecture, they might engage in overseas ministry. Um, they can these days accompany people in continuing ministerial development, those reviews that the BU is introducing. I'm not quite sure how far they've got with that, but uh, it's a good thing. So um, if that's true, calling, offering of ministry still, but in a different mode, there is something that goes with it still, and that's the need to maintain the disciplines of life that undergird effective ministry, the life of prayer, of Bible study, of theological reflection. You know, I reckon I've forgotten a lot along the way, but uh, as a diligent student still, I also reckon that at this point, I know and, understand, and know and understand the Bible better than I ever have done. And also that my theological understanding and awareness is greater than ever before. And that's good for me because it keeps me alert and alive and fresh and I enjoy it. And uh, at times as people come my way, it may be good for other people as well to be able to draw upon things that I have accumulated in my stock of wisdom. So um, the important thing is not to stop and do nothing, not to overdo things, but not to stop growing, um, not to become fixed uh, in our past, but to go on um, enjoying and uh, 
developing the lives that we've been given. Some of you may know this, uh, this book that I published uh, called How to Be a Church Minister. And um, there's a quote that I came across, which I, I like to use, and it's as relevant now as at any point in ministry. It comes from a book called The, the Finishing School by Gail Godwin. And uh, there's a character in it called Ursula who speaks to the narrator, whose name is Justin. And she says this, there are two kinds of people. One kind, you can tell, just by looking at them, at what point they congealed into their final selves. It might be a very nice self, but you know you can expect no more surprises from it. Whereas the other kind keep moving, changing. With these people, you can never say X stops here, or now I know all there is to know about Y. That doesn't mean they're unstable. Oh no, far from it. They are fluid. They keep moving forward and making new trysts with life. And the motion of it keeps them going. In my opinion, they are the only people who are still alive. You must be constantly on your guard, Justin, against congealing. <laughs> <laughs> you can see I like that quote <laughs> so John that's my theological section so having talked a bit about, a bit about the theological perspectives let's um, get on to the psychological and of course here I must add a disclaimer and the disclaimer is that I am not a psychologist and therefore the comments I make uh, are based upon my own awareness of my own psyche and that of others, rather than drawn from academic objective sources. So um, please don't uh, overestimate what I have to say. <clears throat> but clearly, there are changes that we undergo when we retire. Um, I meant to say in the last session um, that uh, I have one instance of a minister who definitely laid down his identity as a minister uh, once he retired. And some of you may remember Dr. Michael Ball, uh, who used to be in Sutton and then in South Wales. And when Michael, who's a very thoughtful person, when Michael came to retire, he actually believed that it was right, going back to this question of vocation, um, to give up uh, his position as a minister and his self-understanding as a minister. So he actually asked that there should be a decommissioning service. So as at the beginning, we might get commissioned and ordained. Um, so at the end, he wanted to be decommissioned and deordained so that uh, he would revert to the status of church member rather than church minister. And whereas that's not something that I would want to do or have felt the need to do or the desire to do at any point, up till now at least, I can clearly understand what, uh, the, what Michael was doing. He was, um, he was handing back a burden or a responsibility or a stewardship that had been entrusted to him. Now, ministry does sometimes feel like a burden. And this is where we begin to enter into the psychological phase, as it were. It does sometimes feel like we're burdened by our responsibility, the anxiety for the church and so on. And um, he took this, what I think was a brave step uh, of actually redefining himself in the eyes of other people. that People should no longer look upon him uh, in this way. And of course, where uh, this is strong is that it's an affirmation of the priesthood of all believers that, that the difference between being a church member and a church minister should not be all that great in that being church members is also a call to holiness of life and a relationship with God and an availability to God. And we sometimes can depress that side of things by our desire to emphasize the value of ministry. And that would certainly be the uh, view that he took. But I can see that that would help him psychologically uh, with unraveling, as it were, his previous self with his self as he was now going to be. Um, 
for me, when I approached retirement, I uh, first thought I would quite like to be employed half time uh, in some task so that I could uh, move, as it were, gradually from full time to part time. Also, because I was quite open to the possibility that I might continue to earn a bit of money in order to fuel my extravagant lifestyle. Um, that's a joke, by the way, if uh, you didn't notice it. Um, that didn't quite work out. Uh, nobody wanted to employ me for whatever reason. Um, but um, I reckon that I did work for the first five years of my time up until COVID struck in a half-time capacity. Uh, if you take into account the amount of study I've been able to do, and one of my ambitions in retirement has been to read all the books in my library. I can see, Mike, that you've got a lot of books behind you and that that may be your ambition too. <laughs> Um, part way through, I've discovered that I'm never going to read all the books in my library, so I've donated at least half of it to Spurgeon's <laughs> in order that I relieve that burden from myself. But I'm enjoying exploring things that I should have read a long time ago in some cases, or perhaps even that I was pretending to have read uh, in, in other cases, because this is, uh, this is the nature of the academic life that uh, you're often um, taking shortcuts. Um, so I've continued to study um, very intentionally both scripture and theology and related subjects like philosophy and history. I've also continued to write. So I've published three books in that time. I've also written extensive amounts of Bible study notes for Scripture Union and Bible Reading Fellowship, and I've enjoyed that immensely. And uh, other articles and so on, that's uh, the kind of thing you get asked to do. I've continued to lecture when asked. I've travelled uh, to lecture fairly often. I'm a visiting professor at an Estonian theological academy. And I've also done a range of funerals, non-religious funerals. I offered myself to do non-religious funerals, and I've done quite a few. And, of course, along the way, I discovered that... Um, Many non-religious funerals aren't all that non-religious that people often do require or ask for some kind of religious or spiritual content, which I have been uniquely qualified to do in ways that uh, a humanist celebrant, for instance, wouldn't be able to do. So as we approach retirement, and I know now that some of you are actually uh, in that process, there are inevitable, inevitable questions um, where to live, um, near family or not near family, somewhere familiar or somewhere new and different in the UK or abroad, one or two that I know have retired to Spain, um, whether I'll have uh, appropriate accommodation um, and what about pensions, what about sufficient income. Now there's this book, I mentioned this in my breakout group, a report produced some years ago by Paul Beasley Murray uh, on the basis of questionnaires and quali qualitative interviews that he engaged in. One of the things that encouraged me and surprised me is that there is very little mention, if any at all, in all the ministers that Paul had to do with uh, of pensioner poverty. The, everybody virtually completely says we've got enough to live on. Uh, we're managing, we're doing quite quite, quite okay. I found that was uh, encouraging. Um, and of course, in times past, things have been uh, a bit different from that. So with these very interesting questions, but I'm not going to touch on them now, about personal circumstances, um, the Baptist Union runs a helpful retirement course. Some of you will have been on it and other courses are available. And then there are more church related questions. So where will we move to, but which church will we join? Do we want to join another Baptist church? Um, I was talking to a minister last week uh, and he said that he and his wife decided that uh, they would only go to a church that they could walk to, that was within walking distance. And so they've ended up in an FIEC, FIEC church. Uh, which he says is a very loving fellowship, although it, it does raise a number of questions for them about some of the things that are assumed in such a congregation. Um, my favourite joke about retirement is going to follow, 
and some of you may have heard it before, but it's rather like the congealing thing. I, I like coming back to that. But uh, there's a story about Jim, who was in the Navy. And as he came up to uh, complete his years of service, um, he didn't want to start working. And so he, he looked for a part-time job. And B&Q offered him a part-time job. And B&Q are quite good at this kind of thing. And uh, they took him on. And um, after three days, the supervisor came to him and said, well, Jim, we, we're really pleased with you. We're really pleased with you know, the work you do. Um, for a start, you're very good with people. And we love to see you engaging with people. Secondly, you, you really know a lot. And uh, you've got a lot of detail there in your mind. And then thirdly, um, when you stack those shelves, uh, you get them really straight and they look really neat and they're really good. So we're very pleased that we took you on. But, but Jim, there is one problem uh, which I'd like to talk about. And it's to do with your timekeeping. And uh, the supervisor said, um, you see, on the first day, you were five minutes late. And on the second day, you were 10 minutes late. And this morning, you were 15 minutes late. Um, now, Jim, when you were in the Navy and you were late, what is it that people would say to you? And so Jim thought for a moment and he said, well, normally they'd say, good morning, Admiral. Where would you like your coffee? <laughs> <laughs> I really like that story. <clears throat> and it, it touches on the issue about change of status, change of role. Um, once you may have had space and respect and regard and uh, deference. Um, yes, all these things come our way in a ministerial role, along with a few other things. <laughs> Uh, and then we go into retirement and it's rather like going back to school again. It's rather like my 11 year old in Edinburgh, who's just finished her primary education and has been in the top class walking around with a hoodie with P7, primary seven on the back in order to mark her significance. And now she's going to go to the high school where she is nothing. She is the lowest of the low and uh, how she will take that. Now, psychologically, uh, these these things, they affect us. Some of us perhaps take it more easily than others, um, but it's an issue. There's the loss of standing. I, I don't like to use the word status, but I do, I do prefer the word standing. Uh, we used to have a location. We knew where we were, where we fitted, and other people knew that. And uh, we used to have perspective because of the, the position that we were in. Um, but now we've, we've lost that. We've lost uh, the standing we had before. We no longer see things from the same um, vantage point. Uh, we've lost agency. We can't, we can't make things happen in the way that we may previously have, at least some of the time, made things happen. Um, your opinion is your opinion, doesn't necessarily carry weight. And there's a kind of powerlessness. Um, when you see other people doing things the way you think they should not be done, there is not a lot that you can do about it. Now, we might find this problematic or we might find it salutary. We might think this is good for me because it means I have to take a humble place and I have to recognize that I am a servant, not any kind of lord. Um, and people's expectations and the way they regard us changes. And perhaps our theology changes. This is an interesting question. I don't intend to go into this, but it's an interesting one. Do, do we, as it were, when we're no longer constrained to take a certain position in the pulpit on certain issues um, or about certain ways of thinking, does that change our theology? Does our theology perhaps broaden out? Uh, so that we become um, not less clear, but less dogmatic, perhaps, in the way in which we think on certain subjects. Somebody might like to raise that. But... So an important concept for me along the way, not just um, in retirement, but hopefully starting well before retirement, is to engage, engage in a process of what's called self-differentiation. I think most of us are pretty good at this, in fact. By self-differentiation, 
Um, basically, I mean, knowing who you, who you are, knowing where you come from, knowing what you think um, in such a way that you're not easily swayed, you're not easily bullied, um, you're not easily threatened by people who have may, may have theological views that don't accord with yours. You know what you think, why you think, and you know who you are. Now, personally, I have to say, I have a strong sense of personal identity. If you, if you were to ask me, I could reel off exactly who I am. I'm a northerner. I'm a Mancunian. I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm a free church person. You know, all of those things. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. Uh, I'm a brother, and so on and so forth. This has left me personally with a strong sense of who I am. And I don't need to the feel, feel the need to defend myself or to justify myself, um, but uh, but to be myself. And I think that does make coming into retirement easier. You are not dependent upon other people to tell you who you are. Uh, you know, and perhaps this is most important, this surfaced in our breakout group, you know you are a child of God and that that is what defines you. Um, you may also be a minister, but it's not what primarily defines you uh, in your sense of personal security and well-being. So um, that is something that helps us, I think, when we get into this new uh, stage that we have to negotiate of uh, discovering ourselves afresh. And part of that, I think, part of being retired generally is, is the importance of memories. Um, this has been more acute in our house because in the COVID period, like a few others I know, we've gone through all our old photographs and we've tried to give them some kind of shape and system and put them in some kind of chronological order. It's amazing how easy it is not to do that, uh, to forget when, where did that happen, who was that we were with and, and so on. So we've been revisiting memories and uh, memories are very precious, um, building memories. People sometimes talk about that, building good memories. I encourage that with my children and the grandchildren uh, to build good memories uh, of people and events and places and times, because later on you draw upon them, you draw upon those things. I guess there'll come a time for all of us when we are less than mobile, we might be much more confined than we currently are. And I imagine that memories will be all the more important um, in those days. I've also often thought that things that you experience are often more, more enjoyable in retrospect than they were at the time. So uh, you might look back upon things in your life and you knew you were enjoying them, but um, you weren't enjoying them to the full. Uh, but now that they're over and gone and any potential risks involved in the situation you may have been in or any sense of nerves that was involved has also gone, you're able to look back upon those moments and savour them. And uh, it does seem to me that this is part of what retirement should be about when we're under our own fig trees and uh, our vines and we're sitting there uh, with a sense of security, reflecting upon what has been. Uh, I have to say that this is not always positive because we might also ask ourselves existential questions like, what was it all about? Um, did it do any good? I've often thought that about when going around preaching in a church somewhere, usually I enjoyed it. Most of the time I felt I was doing something good, but occasionally I would come back home thinking, what was all that about? Why, why did I bother? Um, what did it amount to? What is the lasting value of what I did? What I have been involved in? Uh, I certainly asked myself existential questions like that. I asked, did, did I get it wrong? Did I choose the wrong pathway? The, did I make the wrong decision? Did I, um, did I have the right people working with me? Um, should I have done something else? Actually, I can see your faces and it would really help me if you could nod if you felt the same questions coming to you <laughs> at that point. Because <laughs> I'd like to know I'm not the only one who asks those deep questions. I even have asked myself the question, should I have done something different? Um, 
And that then becomes very quickly, could I have done anything different? Did I have the gifts and the skills to do anything different? Uh, in these days, particularly of COVID, and you see the immense contribution certain people are making, like in the areas of scientific research and the medical people and at all levels. And, and I ask myself, have, have I had um, any more impact upon people's lives than they are having? Had I done those things, had I been one of them, had I chosen a different pathway and learned different skills and had a different kind of education? Would I have done something better than what I managed to do? Um, most of the time I conclude, no, I've done the only thing I really could do, possibly the only thing I was fitted for at the end of the day. Um, but to do it has been a choice as well as a constraint from God. So in this period of reflection, there are many things, good things to to think about, to reflect upon. Um, but let me uh, list some of them from this book that Paul Beasley Murray produced. Uh, when he asked people, ministers retired, uh, what they had most enjoyed and therefore what they most missed. Amongst the repeated things that people listed were seeing people young and old coming to faith. Uh, the joy of baptizing new Christians, experiencing church growth, leading worship, presiding at the Lord's table, preaching every Sunday to the same people, pastoral visiting and care, being part of people's lives, taking dedications, weddings, and funerals. Isn't it strange how you can actually enjoy taking funerals? Developing church premises. I'm not quite sure I identify with that one personally. Uh, working with others. Well, most of those, I guess all of us can say, yep, yeah, those were good things to do. We enjoyed those things. And insofar as we don't do many of them now, or we do them as visitors and guests rather than as those with uh, a deep continuing care for people um we uh, we still enjoy them but there are other things that we uh, we don't enjoy now this is where i change the um the music the mood music from uh, major to minor keys and this is where i risk sharing with you too much information um but I, I want to say it, and I'd be surprised if it didn't have echoes uh, in you, um, because there are negatives that you look back upon, and they resonate, as well as the good things, there are bad things that resonate, um, and they surface. Now, on my laptop, I've got this facility whereby the computer can throw up things onto my screen. Uh, often it's, it's photographs which are uh, there and it's totally random from the stock of photographs that we've got. Um, and it's a little bit like that in my mind that, that things get thrown up as it were, not things I was thinking about, but they just kind of get there. Uh, they, they occur to me, I, something triggers them off. Um, and there is this, I call it a minor key. There is this uh, negative dimension of, uh, of things that I've experienced that have somehow been stored in my psyche and which get thrown up from time to time. So what do I mean? Well, I'm thinking about regrets. That there are things I regret. And these can take many forms. They, 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 they take the form of things in my personal life, like when I was growing up and had certain opportunities to do things which I turned down. And now I regret having turned them down. I wish I'd gone with them. I wish I'd become a proper rugby player, for instance. I wish I'd taken part in the school play. Um, I wish I'd uh, signed up for that Latin course. Um, 
and and I, jo- I wish I'd joined the Boy Scouts when I was invited to do so. Uh, but I I feel now I've missed out on things that I could have done, which would have made me a fuller and more complete person. Perhaps left me with skills that I feel weak in now. Um, but I can't go back. I can't recreate the past. Um, there are also regrets in my pastoral ministry. Um, where I I regret, and I think I could have helped that person more. I I could have been a better pastor to that person. Now, sometimes this was inevitable. Just a couple of the things that crop up randomly. Um, I took the funeral of uh, an elderly gentleman's wife. I didn't know him or I didn't know her, um, and he wasn't in the church. Uh, But I discovered that he had been the pianist for... Stephen and George Jeffries, the Pentecostal evangelists in the first half of the 20th century. And uh, I was able to minister to him. He's a lovely man. And then I, I went on sabbatical and I was abroad. When I got back, I discovered that he'd been asking for me. He was ill. He was dying. He'd been asking for me. And there's nothing I could have done. I, I, I couldn't fly back from wherever I was in order to take his funeral or to care for him. But... It's still there as a regret I, that I, I wasn't there for him. And I'm sad. Or oh, there's the little lady I think of in our church who seemed to be completely on her own. I couldn't work out who her relatives were. She was lovely, um, but she, she was dying. And I remember going to the hospital and she, was, uh, she seemed to be unconscious, um, clearly near the end. And I was holding her hand and, and yet she managed to squeeze my hand. And I I regret that I didn't spend more time with her. I I regret that I didn't stay longer. I had things to do, other people to see. Um, And looking back, I think, I wish I'd just lingered there for as long as it took. Uh, And to tell tell the truth, there are dozens of these things which I look back upon. And I think if I'd been a better pastor, if I'd been more alert, I could have helped. And I, I regret these things. Um, I regret not spending more time visiting, although I spent quite a bit, but you can always spend more. I regret that I didn't relate to my neighbours more effectively, scarcely knew them. Um, I regret that I didn't pay more attention to the children of some of the people uh, in the church, children who hiddenly were possibly suffering from their parents' mental illness or the struggles that they were happening. And I focused on the person, but I wish I'd spent more attention on the child. You know, there are things like this that I regret. And in addition, there are things I resent. Um, People said things or did things or struck certain attitudes. And uh, I resented it. Um... And of course, what you do with resentment is you try and get rid of it. Love keeps no record of wrongs. You hand those things over to God. But sometimes some, some resentments keep coming back. <laughs> they, they kind of don't completely disappear uh, and they keep popping up again. Uh, and, and you wonder why. And again, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, there are embarrassments I look back upon. Now, of all the emotions that we go through, fear, love, surprise, so on and so forth. They say that embarrassment is the one that lasts longest. It's the one, the one with the, the most painful sting. And I can identify with that. And the things I'm thinking of are times when I've been out of my depth. And it's one thing to be out of your depth. It's another thing for people to know you are out of your depth. And I, I look back upon those things. Uh, you know, the, the old saying that it is better to keep silence and be thought a fool uh, than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. And, uh, you know, there are occasions like that, which uh, I still find embarrassing. I don't know how to get rid of it. There are elements of shame, things that I'm shameful. I, I feel shameful about. Um, some of them before I ever became a Christian. Um, and and yet, uh, again, looking back, you think there's, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, 
I, I wish I could. I wish I couldn't do it, uh, but uh, I can't. Um, perhaps I damaged somebody, or perhaps I created some disturbance that needn't didn't need to be there. And sometimes they they these things stay stay buried, but they come back and. If I were a Roman Catholic, perhaps part of me would say, you need to go and find a father confessor and tell him all about it. But I found that hard to do. I have anxiety dreams. Um, I've had them persistently before and after retirement. Now, I reckon that despite any impressions to the contrary, I am actually quite an anxious person. And uh, I worry about things. Um, I enjoy them when I do them, but I worry about them in advance, as it were, as I anticipate them. And uh, at night, I've found that I've had some quite acutely painful uh, dreams. Occasionally, I have a sweet dream, uh, but not very often. And usually when I have a dream, I don't remember its details. It sort of dissolves. Um, but I, I, I remember the outline that I was usually in a situation where I was under pressure, either in a church or a college setting. It's amazing how these things still live in my memory. Uh, and usually I'm perplexed. Usually I'm at fault or feel myself to be at fault uh, in some way. And... Um, uh, the, they linger into the day so that I need during in the morning, I need to uh, to recover sometimes often. I'm talking about several times a week that these things occur and I need to recover. So by the time I've had a shower and a shave and a cup of tea and breakfast, I'm feeling a bit better. Uh, but they contribute to low mood so that I've been surprised how low my mood has been much of the time. Uh, that I have been retired. I've often, well, several times I've thought of going to the doctor and saying, can you give me a happy pill in order to get rid of these low moods that I have? Uh, I know what the doctor would say. He would say, don't be so daft and uh, probably prescribe a course of counselling or something. Uh, so there's no easy fix, but I'd love an easy fix um, along the way. And I, I know I can see why people do go for an easy fix with these things. Um, I, I'm accompanied by guilty feelings. Um, and I think this is the reverse side of a strong sense of duty, a strong sense of responsibility, which I certainly have always had. I am a most conscientious person. And yet the reverse side of a strong sense of duty is that you realize that you're not living up to everything that you might thing you need to do or should do and this is compounded by those for those of us who are Christians because we also have a strong sense of mission that there's a, a perishing world that we are called to save or at least to save in part or at least to engage with God in bringing salvation um, so in the light of a perishing world how can I justify allowing myself um, to take time off or to engage in doing not much at all uh, how can I engage in taking time stolen from the study of Torah, as the Jews would put it? Uh, how can I fritter my life away uh, in the light of such great responsibilities? So the blessing is a strong sense of mission and therefore a strong sense of purpose. Uh, but the reverse side, the shadow side, is this sense of, mm, I don't think I've matched up. I come to the end of my ministry and the end of my life with a sense of uh, unfulfilled realities, things not completed, a job only partly done and not always well done. And then there are disappointments, things that didn't work out, people who didn't work out, uh, decisions that uh, ran into the sand, projects that ran into the sand. Uh, marriages that broke down, um, people who fell away from faith, children who turned away and got into difficulties, 
And overall, a sense that we have ministered, I have ministered, in an age of decline. Um, that these have not been years of favour for the life of the church. Even though all the churches I've been in have been growing churches. Uh, yet the overall trajectory is one of decrease, of, of decline along the way. So how typical of this is, I have no idea. You might be looking at me and thinking, crumbs, poor fella, where did he get all that from? Um, or you might be thinking, yep, yeah, I know a little bit about that, perhaps even a lot about that. Uh, but I leave that up to you. Um, these things run on into retirement and uh, they can affect the way we view the world. Um, perhaps one final thing. Um, Paul Beasley Murray's report, the one that I was showing you, indicates that in the vast majority of cases, uh, the vast majority of cases of all the people he surveyed, um, there was the feeling that they had been inadequately supported by their association or by their union. Um, on the other side, there was the feeling that they had been well supported in the local churches that they had joined, generally speaking. Um, I think one of the points Paul wants to make uh, is one, in a sense, against the, the life of the union in saying, here's an area of neglect, here is something which needs more attention. Now, I do believe that the first port of call for pastoral support should be the local churches that we join. Um, and I can speak personally of uh, a sense of support in retirement from the union. When I retired, Paul Goodliffe wrote me a very nice letter thanking me for what I'd done um, very quickly on moving to where we now are in Cheshire. Our regional minister came to visit us late one night. Uh, we do have an annual invitation to attend the retired minister's event of some kind, which usually involves food that we don't have to pay for. And all of these things are welcome. Uh, so I'm not going to complain personally. Um, I feel uh, if I've served the union in some way, the union has also served me in a myriad of ways. And I'm not going to complain about anything uh, there. But I do also feel that there is an area here which needs attention, that any association uh, that wants to make the mess the best of its retired ministers, that wants to draw upon all those good things that we talked about that we can do, that we could do, has to take initiatives in order to know who those ministers are, uh, to know where they are, uh, to know what they are wanting to do or not to do in retirement and uh, to know what they are capable of doing given their circumstances and so on. Um, so I, that is a, a thing that our union would do well to develop. And I was very pleased last week when I was in the East Midlands area that they are taking initiatives and they're doing it by asking a retired minister who is just retired to take responsibility for it, to take initiatives. And that seems to me to be a very good approach, not to add more burdens to regional ministers who are already burdened, but to mobilize those who are capable and willing and wanting to be useful still. So there we are. I think I may have come to the end of my time or just up to it, um, but uh, there we are, John, I hand back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Thank you for um, uh, being so open and honest with us. And we appreciate that very much.